Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to turn to Psalm 1 now. And Psalm 1 is the passage that we're going to be looking at today. Uh, I don't know what it is in your Bibles in terms of a page number, but I'm going to read to us from Psalm 1, the whole psalm, as we kick off this new sermon series on the book of Psalms. Psalm 1. How happy is the man who does not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path of sinners or join a group of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction and he meditates on it day and night. He's like a tree planted beside streams of water that bears its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. The wicked are not like this. Instead, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not survive the judgment and the sinners will not be in the community of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to ruin. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to begin with a pretty obvious question. What's the good life? Where do I find it? Is there anything such as the good life? Now, they're questions that we often ask as people, as parents, as husbands and wives, as families, as members of countries and communities. They're the questions that often run our lives, communities, and make our decisions, decide and direct our affections, structure our parenting, organise our diaries, and seek our devotion. Human existence seems to be organised about getting the good life, the life that's blessed, happy and content. Now, some of us search for it in meaning, building our lives around our purpose and place in the world. Some of us search for it in nostalgia. Things were better back when. Some of us search for it in our families and the futures that we design for ourselves and our children. Some of us search for it in our work, our income, our toys. Some of us search for it in leisure. Some of us just give up on the search and we anesthetize ourselves with activities and work and substances. Well, today we're going to begin a book that deals with the good life and where you can find it. Let me lead us in prayer. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, thanks for poets and people who write them, write poems. Thanks for songs. Uh, thanks for the revelation of your character in this book, the book of Psalms. Father, please apply it to us today, this ancient poetry which is now ours. In Jesus' name, amen. I right, point two on the outline. One of the first things uh, that I did when I got up there for the first time on the top of Mount Kaputar at that lookout, I, I wanted to get my bearings. I, I wanted to work out where I was in relation to all the stuff that I knew down there on the plains. Uh, that's what that little dial on the top of that little monument's all about, helping you to get your bearings where you fit. And it's the same when you get to the mountain peak that is the book of Psalms. We need to get our bearings. Now, a psalm's a very simple thing. It's a poem. It's a song. Uh, it's a piece of literature that by its very nature will be emotional, colourful, and full of illustrations. But don't let that fool you into thinking that it's just all made up stuff. These are the words of God. These are the vehicles of truth in emotional and illustrative language. These are the lived experiences of the people of God as they try to navigate this broken world. Now, when each psalm was composed, is really hard to nail down. The composition of each one is hard to decipher. Many of them have superscriptions, you know, little words at the top that were added later where people guessed or knew who wrote them and when they wrote them. Well, what we do know for sure is that they were composed over a massive period of time, hundreds of years. Psalm 90, which kicks off book four, was written by Moses, the great leader of God's people in the first five books of the Bible as they came out of slavery into their land. Psalm 137 and probably Psalm 74 were written during the exile at the other end of their history when they'd been kicked out of the land, when they'd been judged by God and removed from his presence. 
So the period of the Psalms being composed is really the whole Old Testament. But that also helps us understand when the book was compiled, the compilation of the whole book, when it was put together in the form we've got five books in the book of Psalms and 150 poems, book put together so that God's people could use it together. There's no doubt that Psalms were used right throughout the whole Old Testament, throughout the whole period of God's people. They always seem to be singing. But the book of Psalms, as we've got it today, as you hold in your hands at this very moment, was most likely composed after God's people came back from exile. The early 500s BC, their return to the land that God had given them was bittersweet. They'd come home, but they weren't free. They were under the rule of Persia. They'd come home, but their borders had shrunk. They'd come home, but the temple, that great picture of God hanging out with his mob, was a shambles and a miniature version of what they'd enjoyed before. They'd come home, but the kings who had ruled them from the family of David were no more. They'd come home, but... And so as God's people returned home, as they pick up the pieces, as they consider the diminished life they have as a nation, as they consider the promises of God that created them, they naturally have questions, questions we're familiar with. Where's the good life? Where's our God? What's our future? What about those promises of God? And I think that this book of songs and poems and hymns was put together as a way of helping them remember the answers to those questions. Now, every good book's got an introduction. Uh, An introduction is the way to grab you and pull you in to lay out the basic themes. Uh, Psalm 1 and 2 are the introduction to this book. They're unique in the first book of the book of Psalms because unlike every other book in book 1 of Psalms, Psalms 1 to 41, unlike every other psalm, We're not told who wrote them. We're not given any information about them. These psalms start and end with the same idea. If you look in your Bible, Psalm 1 begins with happy and Psalm 2 finishes with happy and both psalms consider the opposite of the good life, the life away from God. These two psalms stand as the entry point, the guidepost, the doorframe, for coming into this book of poetry. To understand the book of Psalms means you've got to understand Psalms 1 and 2. And we're going to dive into Psalm 1 in a moment, but let me just quickly recap where we've been. The Psalms were composed over a vast period of time for God's people, all the Old Testament. The Psalms are probably compiled as a five-part book with 150 Psalms as a songbook for God's people. The Psalms are probably compiled sometime after the return from exile. In that history, God's people have returned home, but they're diminished and troubled. Where's the good life? Where's our God? And they have a very clear introduction, Psalms 1 and 2. Well, I want you to remember the last time, and I'm at point three on the outline, that you stood in a queue at Woolies or Carl's. You've often got those magazines just to your left as you queue up or your right. And often the titles of those magazines draw your attention to a person and say, look at their life. And when you look at their life, look what your life might possibly be or look at the life that you want. Uh, In a similar but much more profound way, Psalm 1 says, look at this life. Look at verse 1. How happy is the man who does not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path of sinners or join a group of mockers. Psalm 1 wants you to look at the good life, life as it should be, life that is deeply rich and full of joy. And to do so is to look at someone who has understood what the good life is not. Did you see that there in verse 1? The good life does not follow, does not walk in, does not sit down with those who are opposed to God. Do you see that progression there in verse 1? From hearing 
to walking, to joining the community of the people who oppose God, to sit completely under its influence. It's the advice of the wicked. It's the advice of the sinners. It's to hang out with the mockers. It's the way of life that says at heart, I'm God and God's not. It's not just a passive life, but it's a whole of life that says, I'm independent from God. I don't want to listen to him. Remember the context for the composition and compilation of Psalms? Remember that it was compiled when God's people were diminished, when they doubted, when they were small and vulnerable and surrounded by a world that had seen their struggles and dominated them. There are so many seemingly viable alternatives around them. And this poem says, don't pay attention to them. That's not the good life. Instead, in verse 2, we're told what the good life is all about. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction and he meditates on it day and night. If verse 1 is what the good life is not, then verse 2 is what the good life is. And just as there were three things it was not, so there are three things that describe the good life. The good life delights in something. That delight is in the Lord's instruction. And the Lord's instruction is meditated upon constantly. You know what life is like when it's delightful, when it's full of good stuff, when everything seems just joyful? Well, the good life delights in something here. It's not possessions. It's not social standing. It's not reputation. It's not individual or family success. It's not education or learning. It's not good food or rich experience. It's not even self-worth or value. The delight of the good life is in the Lord's instruction. And there is so much in that phrase. The Lord, see it there in capitals, Well, that's the personal name of God. It's the name his mob his household, his family used with him. It's a name that describes him as the God who is personally committed to a broken world and to do something about it, even as humans turn away from him. And that Lord's commitment is expressed in his words, in his instruction, in his revelation, in his speaking, in what the people of the Psalms described as Torah. It is God's self-revealing word which describes both him and his world and his relationship with the world. It's what the people of God used to describe the first five books of the Bible, the Torah. Well, Have you ever wondered why the book of Psalms has five books? It's God's word about how and why the world was made. Remember Genesis? What went wrong with the world? Remember Genesis? His commitment to restore the world through the family of Abraham. Remember Genesis? It's the very expression of the very nature of God himself. Personal, committed, unwavering in his desire for people with his image to hang out with him. And the good life is found by delighting in that. And that delight is expressed in constant meditation. It's not like the meditation of this world. The meditation of this world is pretty simple. You just empty yourself and sit there like a hollow cup. No, no, this meditation is very different. This is the meditation where you read God's word and think on God's word and speak and mumble and chew over God's word. It's to marinate in God's word. It's to read it and speak it. It's to cogitate on it, to discuss it, to share it. It's to be so bathed in the Lord's instruction that everything spoken, thought, read, desired, felt is wrapped up in it. It's to be embedded in it. It's to be immersed in it in all of your existence. Now, in case we miss the richness of that, we're then given a wonderful picture in verse 3, aren't we? He's like a tree planted beside streams of water 
that bears its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither, whatever he does prospers. Now, that is, uh, just think, you've returned from exile into a desert-like land which is dry and dusty and you find a tree that's flourishing, that does not cease with its fruit, whose leaves never curl up under the heat, which is always green and full of shade. That's the picture. The picture of a tree which is watered and deeply rooted and productive and prospering and full of life and persisting, not withering but fruitful. Isn't that a picture that gives you hope and satisfaction? And it's deeply planted in its life source, fed by water that bubbles up and nourishes it, makes it really fruity. It's that word planted that really sets off a trigger for God's people as they sing this psalm. That word's been used in God's word, in God's Torah. If you've got your Bibles there, turn with me to Genesis chapter 2, verses 7 to 8. Then the Lord formed the man out of the dust from the ground and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, and the man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and there he placed the man he had formed. That's the same word for planted that we get in Psalm 1. So when we hear that image of the tree, we were meant to think that's how God designed it to be. Way back there with Adam in the garden of Eden. Here under the Lord's instruction, Adam flourished and enjoyed the good life He walked daily with the Lord. He lived with his wife Eve and they flourished. That's the good life. And for God's people, returning to that land, here was the reminder that they needed. The good life exists. The good life is not found in immersing yourself in the world around you in its way or walking or sitting with it. The good life is found in delighting in what the Lord has spoken in his Torah as he's committed to the world he's made. Just look at your history. Well, there's an alternative to the good life. I'm at point four on the outline. It's hinted at in verse one. It's the life described as wicked, but which is simply life without regard to God. It's described with a contrasting image in verse four and a reminder of the right perspective in verse five. Look there in verse four with me. (coughs) The wicked are not like this. Instead, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Is there any contrast that's greater to the planted tree, planted by running water, fruitful and long-lasting, never withering? Is there any greater contrast than chaff, weightless, useless, unproductive, insubstantial, blown away, temporary, a husk, a shell? Well, that's the way of those who choose to delight in everything except the Lord. And the reality, and we'll return to this in a moment, the reality around you might look different. Just remember God's people returned from exile, beset by doubts, ruled by that superpower of Persia where the wickedness seems so substantial. Well, that's why we're given the right perspective in verse 5. Therefore... Lift your eyes. The wicked will not survive the judgment and sinners will not be in the community of the righteous. The perspective of the good life is not just now, but it's then. It's the future. The day when everything will be called to order and everyone in the world and all of history will have to account for their lives before the one who gave them life. On that day, the final proof of the good life and the exposure of the not good life will take place. And so in that sense, the right perspective is helpful in the good life. It goes with getting your bearings right. How would you summarise what we've just learned? Well, you get a summary there in Psalm 1, don't you? I'm at point 5 on the outline. Look at verse 6. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to ruin. On face value, it's really quite simple. The summary is as simple as the poem itself. 
the good life is the life connected to the Lord. It is really that simple. The good life is the life connected to the Lord. A life connected to the Lord is a life lived, immersed in his instruction, his word. A life connected to the Lord is a life lived in contrast, a life lived unlike the world. A life connected to the Lord is a life that involves conscious decision. A life connected to the Lord is a life lived with a long-term perspective, eternal. Ah, really, on face value, I'm at point six on the outline, a poem like this is uncomplicated and simple. But let me share with you that it might cause you, it certainly causes me, some tensions. Tensions that I suspect God's people felt as they returned from the exile. Uh, Looking around the world that I live in, just as they would have looked around the world they lived in, the wicked don't seem like chaff, do they? Many of their empires are substantial and many of them are explicitly successful. It's not so it's it's so hard not to listen to their advice. It's so hard not to walk in their paths, to sit with them in their success. The choice placed before God's people here in Psalm 1, back then when it was compiled into a book and even now, well, that choice just seems too hard. I mean, I can avoid the bad jokes, but what about that advice about work and the future and reputation and community standing and making sure that I'm not left behind? But it's even deeper than this, isn't it? You see, I know my heart. My delight is not by nature in the Lord's instruction. Left to my own devices, and this is the case for any of us, I can't even consistently delight in what God says, let alone meditate upon it. Is there any hope that I, is there any hope that God's people at any point in history could ever sing Psalm 1 with gusto and a clear conscience? I mean, we could just give in. It's too hard to make decisions that put you on the outside. So why not just join those who reject God, just in certain areas? Easy to mouth the platitudes, make sure that you at least appear with God's people on the outside, enjoy that community, but also make sure that you sit with those who get ahead in the things that matter. Or we could just give up. I mean, what difference does it make? Dead dogs get somewhere when they just float along in the river. So why shouldn't we just float along with them? We could even just drown in nostalgia or regret. If only things were like they used to be. They're all possible responses, aren't they? Temporary fixes. In reality, we know deep down that they will lead to a life eternally that has no substance. That does not last. So I think the answer to these tensions that we feel are in the idea of planted and in the idea of blessed. You see, after that first planted in Genesis 2, 7 to 8, we know what happens in Genesis 3, don't we? There's a great uprooting. Humans are removed from the presence of the Lord because they doubt, disobey and disregard his word. They live under their own instruction. The Bible clearly describes that moment in Genesis 3 and Psalm 1 describes it in verse 1 and verses 4 and 5. God's commitment is steadfast. He doesn't move from his commitment to the world. The Lord commits and says that one day someone born from a woman will crush that snake. Remember Genesis 3.15? One day. Someone will deal with what caused the uprooting. Well, soon after God wiped out the world and effectively started again with Noah. Do you know that Noah planted too the same word in Genesis 9.20? If you're following that word, your hopes might be raised, but then they're dashed, aren't they? Because Noah's not the man to crush the snake. Uh, The Lord's commitment to this world is then made as we know, in a solemn promise to the family of Abraham. 
Through Abraham's family, as we've learned over the last few years, God will roll back sin and bring blessing. Abraham planted too. Did you know that? The same word there in Genesis 21, 33, just after his son Isaac was born. Our hopes are raised if we're following that word, but then they're dashed again. Abraham dies. He's not going to be the man to crush the snake. And so on, right throughout history, right up until the people of God, Abraham's descendants, return to that land that they'd been promised. An image of that garden in Genesis 2. An image of what the good life could be. And so they kept looking forward. When would God crush sin? When would God return them to the good life that they had experienced in Adam way back then? When would the life where sin was defeated, when would that life come? And so on and so on and so on. And the historical record of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Perhaps this will be the man. This man, Jesus. At his baptism, our hopes are raised. His family tree is good, but at his baptism, our hopes are raised again. When God describes his delight in his boy, remember the reading from Matthew 3? Our hopes are raised even further. It is temptation when Jesus delight in the Lord's instruction and his meditation on it in Matthew chapters 3 and 4 cause him to tell the devil to rack off unlike any man has ever done. Our hopes are raised even further when Jesus' first teaching session, that reading from Matthew 5, 1 to 17, that first teaching session of his disciples begins with the very same word that begins Psalm 1, happy or blessed. And all things are confirmed that this is the man. When Jesus states very clearly in Matthew 5.17 that he has come to fulfill Torah, the Lord's instruction, that Jesus is the revelation of God, that Jesus is everything Torah spoke about. This is the man. This is the one who'll crush sin, bring God's blessing. This is the one who delights in the Lord's instruction and is never moved from it. This is the one approved by God. This is the one who'll live perfectly as God intended so that he can die for us, taking that judgment we deserve. And even at that point, as Jesus died, the Lord looked over him and raised him. Jesus is Psalm 1. He is the man who is blessed. Because he alone of all humanity delighted perfectly in the Lord's instruction and he will never wither. So here is the relief of the deepest and greatest tension. I can't be someone, but Jesus is someone. I can't be someone, but Jesus is someone. So here is the good life that God's people looked for every time a great person of faith emerged that God's people looked for from Abraham's family, that God's people desperately searched for as they came back from exile diminished. Here is the good life. Be connected to Jesus. The connection is as simple as trusting him, taking him at his word, knowing that by trusting him, everything he is, we get. Now that being understood, We've still got that other tension, haven't we? The first one I mentioned, that we remain living in this world, surrounded by those who reject Jesus and God and still seem to thrive. How do we deal with that? Well, at this point, I'm at the last point on the outline. At this point, we can sing Psalm 1. Being connected to Jesus, we are part of God's people with the Lord's instruction. We keep life in the right perspective. Remember Psalm 1 encourages us to consider the good life and the not good life eternally. doesn't avoid reality now as we'll find out as we work through the Psalms, but it does understand the big picture. It means our decisions now, and we'll get to them in a moment, are made in light of the decision that will be made then. We delight in the Lord's instruction meditating upon it. There's no other foundation for the good life. Now, I want us to think on each part of that sentence from Psalm 1. Do I delight in the Lord's instruction? 
Do I meditate upon the Lord's instruction? Is the Lord's instruction, his personal revelation in his word, in Jesus Christ, is the Lord's instruction my place of joy, delight and foundation? Does it so consume my whole life that every part of my existence, my desire and my decision is brought under it? We make conscious decisions that remove us from the path of the wicked, walking with the wicked, sitting under the authority of the wicked. You see, if I do not have the foundation of my delight in the Lord's instruction, in his very nature and character, then how do I make my decisions? How do I make decisions about work and leisure and money that mean that I can dwell not only with the Lord's instruction, but meet consistently with his household? How do I make decisions about my family and my children that will set them up for eternity with the Lord and not to be chaff that is just well-educated and sporty? How do I make decisions about my household and my relationships that allow us to marinate in the Lord's instruction together? How do I make decisions about my identity as a man or a woman, as a husband or a wife, as a son or a daughter that show God's explicit design? How do I regard success and reputation in such a way that the good life is shown to our world to be connected to Jesus and to Jesus alone. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the book of Psalms. Thank you for when they were composed and when they were compiled. Thank you that they deal with the questions we still have. Thank you that Jesus is Psalm 1, and so we can sing it. Father, help us to sing it with gusto and the knowledge that you have dealt with our sin in Jesus for us. Amen.